Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, we are Beta NYC. We are specifically the Civic Innovation Lab team, and we're excited to share a couple of the lab's projects with you all. In this session, we're going to just do a quick recap on Beta NYC, who we are, if you missed it this morning. And then um, each uh, member of the lab is going to present a project. This is where we work. We're located in downtown Manhattan. Uh, our office is in the Manhattan Borough President's office, um, right at the base of the Brooklyn Bridge. So we work very closely with government agents. Um, we have three branches to Beta NYC. One is the fellowships and apprentices, apprenticeships, uh, where we work with New York City students and give them uh, exposure to civic leadership. Um, and this is us, the Civic Innovation Lab. We work with civic data services for New York City communities and elected offices. And the third branch is the public data literacy programs. So that would be the branch that helped to organize uh, Open Data Week and School of Data, which you're all attending here today. This is uh, the team. We're a humble group of five of us. This is Audrey also joining virtually. So hi, I'm Eric. I am the lab manager. Um, yeah, I'll be presenting a little bit on asylum seekers later on. Hi, I'm Audrey and I am the lab team's data analyst. And I'm gonna be presenting on a project I did regarding school budget and allocations data and building a dashboard for the Community Education Council. Uh, hi, my name is Lun. I'm the front-end developer associate in Beta NYC Lab, and I'm going to present the MTA Ridership project. Hi, my name is Haley, and I am the UX designer associate working at the lab, and the projects I'm going to present today is the Housing Court Must Change mapping tool. And my name is Ashley. I direct the lab. Uh, I'm going to do a quick recap of our flood gen tool, which we are excited to launch today. Um, but we had already presented that earlier today as well. Um, so a lot of the work that we do uh, are research and data assistance requests. So the Civic Innovation Lab is where we address the civic challenges with government agencies and community-based organizations using data technology and design. So to date, our lab has serviced over 400 radars and we have worked with over 200 elected officials, community organizations, and nonprofits. Um, these are a list of some of the partners we've, we've worked with um, over the past couple years. So what is a research and data assistance request? Um, you can come to us with a request for many things, to name a few, like we, we do a lot of data analysis, data visualizations, and sometimes we also uh, work with you to create a custom tool. Um, so that involves a little bit of design and front end web development. We're gonna cover a little bit of what's under the hood, um, what's on the inside look of how we approach radars. So we're gonna we're gonna go through all of our projects through emphasis stronger emphasis on certain phases more than others. Um, so from data collection, web scraping, data analysis and visualization, building a dashboard, or creating analysis and visualizations to communicate um, publicly. Um, and then, uh, yeah, doing the design of the front end website, um, what, an, what an end product looks like once we've developed it. And something that's critical to every aspect of a radar is, is the partners that we work with and staying true to sort of our mission by uh, ensuring there's some sort of advocacy component. So yeah, uh, as Ashley said, we're all going to go through some projects that the Beta NYC lab has worked on. I will be presenting on asylum seeker data. So I'm sure as many of you know, as New York residents, uh, there is a kind of a crisis going on with asylum seeker um, asylum seekers in the city at the moment. Uh, the New York Times reports that more than 150,000 people have arrived in New York City in less than two years. Uh, so this has kind of become like a very large issue that has sort of engulfed a lot of uh, different city agencies. We originally got involved with this issue uh, through a radar submission uh, where someone at the Leonard branch of the Brooklyn Library 
was looking for a list of shelters uh, so that they would be able to better allocate library resources to serve different populations inside of Brooklyn. So to address this, we had to submit a FOIL request. Uh, so if you don't know, uh, the FOIL, FOIL is a New York state law that came after the 1966 Freedom of Information Act at the federal level. So that was the FOIA law. Uh, the New York Freedom of Information Law was a series of laws designed to guarantee that the public had access to public records of government bodies. Um, and the law was originally passed in 1974, but it was then repealed and replaced with another law that, that added significant changes in 1977. Uh, so that allowed, uh, eventually led to the creation of the open data portal. Uh, however, for this specific issue that we were looking into, as you can see, at both the New York State as well as the New York City open data portals, uh, there is no asylum seeker or any data related to uh, asylum seekers at all. So this led us to uh, realize that asylum seeker data needs to be more accessible in order to promote advocacy and decision making throughout the city. Uh, so with more data, individuals and community groups can better understand and advocate for change in the world around them. Uh, we thought of two use cases, although we're sure that there are many more. Uh, so for one, community groups uh, want to understand where shelters are, that way they can better focus their involvement throughout uh, where they're focused, uh, as well as advocates may want to petition the state and federal government for funding for asylum seekers in New York. Uh, both of these things, in order to do these things, uh, data is needed to make like a strong case for why uh, certain changes need to be made. Uh, this data uh, is already key in many of the efforts being made by city officials. Uh, back on September 9th, Mayor Adams uh, had specifically requested that uh, both the state and federal governments uh, commit more funds towards asylum seekers over the next two years. Uh, as you can see from the chart, New York City has committed six times more than the state and federal governments combined towards supporting asylum seekers in New York City. Uh, sort of core to this issue uh, then is understanding where New York City and New York State fall in relation to the rest of the uh, the rest of the country. And in order to understand that more data is needed that is just was not currently available to us. So then the question becomes, how can we make data more accessible for further analysis? And the answer to that that we came up with was web scraping. So uh, a web web scraping is a process where an automated script, or program navigates a website to access pages and extract data from those pages for various purposes such as data analysis, market research, real-time data monitoring, or automating tasks that rely on web-based data. Uh, that might be sound like somewhat of a complicated explanation. So to break it down into just three simple steps, uh, a web page is accessed and navigated by a bot uh, to then extract data. So. Uh, we are going to walk through sort of an example of web scraping uh, through the use of the asylum seekers data. So the first step for web scraping is to identify what need uh, uh, to identify what information we need and where we can find it online. For asylum seekers, what that meant was talking to experts within uh, talking to experts or people who were more familiar with this topic. Uh, so we turned to members of the New York City Council data team. Uh, who pointed us towards the Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse at Syracuse University, who published in-depth data on asylum seekers on a monthly, semi-monthly basis, uh, obtained through the federal government through the FOIA Act. So after you actually have that information, it's necessary to sort of understand what the page looks like. Uh, for this pro specific project, uh, this is just one example that we're going to walk through. Uh, the Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse has a lot of different um, data sets uh, that they publish. Uh, however, the data is not necessarily published as you know a CSV or something that we would be easily accessible. Instead, it's published in these charts. So we're able to break it down by a few different um, categories. So when you look at the page, one of the first things that you'll notice, or that we noticed rather, was that there is a list of states a list of courts, and a list of nationalities. Uh, so for us, that meant that we understood that we had to under, uh, break down all of this information by each of those three. So 
you can combine each uh, state, a court, and a nationality in order to get specific information for that spe a unique combination. So uh, after that, it's necessary to sort of choose what tools we think would be best to uh, answer this request and exactly do what we think is necessary. Uh, we chose Python because that's sort of just like what a lot of the analysis in the lab is already used for. Uh, so a sort of quick guide for how to sort of choose which tools you want. Um, if you need to make a click on the page, uh, usually we end up using Selenium. Uh, Selenium is an open source suite of tools and libraries that allow, the, uh, that allow for browser automation. So that actually opens up a window on your computer that is able to click each individual element as if uh, a human being were doing that. Uh, if we didn't need to click, we would just be able to use something like Beautiful Soup uh, and just navigate through the pages. Uh, however, for this one, we had to use Selenium. The last thing uh, after that, it's just a matter of actually writing the scraper. Uh, so we are going to walk through a little bit of what exactly the scraper does. Uh, we're not going to go through the actual code itself, but instead just uh, sort of talk about the steps that are taken within this specific script. So first, the web page is opened uh, uh, with the information that we want to scrape. After that, it will select a single uh, state from the list of states. Then it will select a court from the list of courts. And then it will select a nationality from the list of nationalities. And uh, what we actually noticed is after a selection is made on the page, uh, a network request is made on the page that then returns the information for uh, to be displayed. So if you were to follow the URL from that network request, then you're able to access the information. And then it's just a matter of saving that information somewhere that it can be accessed later. So effectively what happens is that that unstructured data is turned into structured data for later analysis. Uh, after that, it's just a matter of rinsing and repeating that reset, uh, that uh, process. After all the nationalities are selected for the court and the state, then it moves on to the next court. And then after all the courts are selected, then it moves on to the next uh, state. Uh, and the result is that uh, there's one large table that can be exported with all of the data for all the unique combinations of state, court, and nationality. After that, it's just a matter of uh, the last thing that you have to do is process and store that information. Uh, so once the data is scraped, it might not be as clean as you might want. Uh, so some further pre-processing might be necessary, and then you're able to save it. So we chose to store both the data and the scrapers on GitHub for public access. So uh, these slides are accessible on the uh, School of Data website if you go to our event. Uh, and then you'll be able to access both our data, so the data from this, which had the pending court cases, as well as other data sets uh, and the actual scrapers themselves for things such as wait times and other uh, data sets related to asylum seekers at both of these addresses. Uh, so as an example of what can be done with this data, uh, we were able to put together a uh, dashboard using Tableau uh, that actually displayed how this, uh, how this crisis has been going down in New York State and New York City specifically, and compared that to other states uh, and other cities throughout the rest of America. Uh, however, we're not going, I'm not going to go into that too much, and instead I'm going to let Audrey explain to you about uh, the process of creating a Tableau dashboard and other analysis that we, the lab is able to do. Great, thanks, Eric. So yeah, I'm gonna be talking about the process that I went through to create a dashboard for New York City Galaxy budget and allocations data. So first, I'm just gonna walk through a little bit of project overview. So to give kind of a broad look at the school budget process in New York City, I'm gonna talk about some key terms that are relevant in this process. So first, um, school leadership teams are in charge of oversight for New York City public schools. These are made up of principals, teachers, parents, students, et cetera, and they're really in charge of developing CEPs or comprehensive educational plans for schools each year that outline strategies and goals for student outcomes. And so in order to actualize these CEPs, they need to align their budget and funding accordingly. And so in New York City, in New York City funding comes from various allocation sources at a city, state, federal, and even private level that range in flexibility. Some are very specific in what they have to be spent on and some allow schools for a lot of range of motion in kind of that sense. And so with regard for their comprehensive educational plans and these allocations categories, schools develop their school budget spending plans. And these 
budget items directly impact school quality. The budget items include things like electives offered, student teacher ratios, special needs support, after school programs, etc. And so this process really is instrumental in determining the quality and educational fabric of New York City. And so, oops, too many slides. Go back. Okay. And so more specifically, our project was really focused on processing, accessing, and understanding this data. We were approached by a Manhattan Community Education Council with a request for research and data assistance or a radar. And they were really interested in looking at this data and understanding how to make it more useful for stakeholder decision-making and specifically for school leadership teams. And so the problem here is that this Galaxy portal setup is not super easy to use. The data is available, but it's not accessible or navigable, and it's pretty limited in terms of analysis capabilities. There's no, no ability to cross compare or aggregate the data. And also you have to search by an individual school code and year in order to view data, which makes it challenging to understand overarching trends. And so our focus question here was how to make this raw data useful kind of at a high level. And so specifically, we're going to explore this question through the case study of the school budget project, where we were exploring how to derive insights from that raw data source. And so useful in this case, we've chosen to define in kind of three major categories. First, we wanted our data to be insightful. We wanted to distill key insights from the raw data in order to inform stakeholder decision making. We wanted our data to be accessible. We knew that our end users were going to come from a variety of different technical backgrounds. So we wanted to make sure that they were able to easily understand and utilize the data. And then finally, we wanted the data to be visual. We wanted to visually communicate insights that would enable further analysis for our end user stakeholders. And so now I'm going to walk through what this looks like at the kind of lab level process. So really the problem begins by identifying our raw data set. So in this case, the Galaxy budget summaries and allocations portal. And then in this case, our budget or our data was not consolidated. And so we built a web scraper similarly to Eric's project in order to extract this information and create master data sets for use. And then from there, we went into building a data dashboard. And so this kind of fell into three major steps. The first was doing a stakeholder needs assessment. We identified data possibilities and as well as use cases for our end users. And then we focused on wrangling and analyzing the data by doing joins, calculations, aggregations, et cetera, which I'm going to walk through more granularly in a minute and then ultimately build a Tableau dashboard. So this is the step of the process that I'm really going to be emphasizing today. And then finally, oops, um, we focused on stakeholder engagement. We were returning this product to school leadership teams in order to support their alignment of budget and CEPs. And so now I'm going to walk through two specific data wrangling case studies to kind of get under the hood of this project a little bit. So the first case study is focused on joining enrollment data. So in this case, we were really interested in contextualizing the allocations and budget monetary amounts with enrollment data in order to create dollars per student metrics. The challenge here is that enrollment data sets come from the state level and have different identifiers for the specific schools than at the city level. And so we couldn't do a traditional join. And so we needed to parse the data in order to align the state level IDs with the city level school IDs. And so in order to do this, I researched the conversions, documented the methodology, and then ended up coming with an Excel process using lookup tables and extractions to join the data sets. You can see here, I have a snapshot of that conversion guide. Um, at the state level location ID, we have digits that indicate different things. And then at the New York City specific level, there are some more granular conversions. And so through that process, I was ultimately able to join these data sets and then write a Python calculation script in order to come up with these contextualized values. And so at the bottom here, I also have an example of what that process looked like for one school and through that kind of Excel step process. And so ultimately through this process, I was able to reimagine this net allocations and budget figure to per student values that really was able to humanize those numbers and align them more with our stakeholder needs. And then also enabled us to cross compare different schools, regardless of their school size, and then ultimately compare these values to a New York City wide average. And so another data wrangling case study that I'm going to talk about is using Python keyword mapping for aggregation. 
And so in this case, we were focused on the allocations data set, and we faced a challenge because allocations categories are uniquely named. And so it's challenging to aggregate them for analysis. And we wanted to bucket the categories, but naming is pretty inconsistent, which created a need for keyword mapping. And so in order to do this, I developed a list of categories of interest. In this case, we were looking at fair student funding, Title I, and pre-K funding as initial categories of focus, and then identify key terms that could be mapped onto these categories. And then with that, I was able to write a Python mapping script to ultimately create these categories. Obviously, there are limitations here. These categories are non-exhaustive and broad, and so we're hoping to eventually pull more categories out of the other list for inclusion as we continue to develop this project. And so ultimately, I was able to success successfully map unique allocations categories to items to categories and create this area chart. Here you can see how all of those allocation categories have very unique naming conventions. Um, but ultimately, we were able to build this figure that allowed us to visualize trends in different categories and also in overall allocations. And so finally, I'm going to demonstrate our final Tableau dashboard um, so far in our development. And so here is that dashboard. It's created in Tableau. You can see kind of a demonstration of the tooltip, which provides kind of deeper insights into the various data points. And here there's a really cool functionality where you can toggle between allocation categories and focus on different ones to see trends as well as to exclude different data categories. And so this is really exciting because we're able to make this data more accessible and visual for our school leadership teams, both kind of at a high surface level and then through the Tableau capabilities, give them the tools to be able to delve deeper into the data and derive the insights that are most helpful for them. Oops. Oh, okay. And so in terms of next steps, we're planning to add a couple of additional figures to the dashboard and also create some good documentation for our stakeholders. As I mentioned, they tend to come from a variety of different technical backgrounds. So we really want to make sure that we're providing them with the information necessary to understand these visualizations and have reference information to contextualize the different data points. And in terms of timeline, we're working toward a launch in May. And so coming back to that high level, here are just some final tips on how to transform raw data. You need to understand your stakeholder needs and explore those data possibilities. And then through that, align your key metrics and figures, do your data wrangling, use the tools in your toolbox to make that data consumable for your figures, and then ultimately visually communicate your key findings. Okay, and so now Loon is going to talk about analysis of subway ridership patterns. So, hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the project, research project, which is exploring the ridership patterns of MTA subway stations. Um, so before getting to the project itself, I'd like to talk about the motivation, like why I'm going, to, why I'm doing this project. And as a daily MTA commuters, like live nearby the L train stations, uh, I was ha I, especially in the weekend. I I have the hard time like waiting for the trains. <laughs> so during the wait, I always like wondering why does the MTA do construction on weekend? Does it really do the best to the commuters or not? So to be more specific, I list out three research questions of that. So the first one is how does the MTA subway ridership in New York City differ between weekdays and weekends? And are fewer people impacted when construction impacts service uh, on the weekends? What can we learn about New York, New York City from MTA subway ridership data? So uh, the main data set is the MTA subway hourly ridership and the time scale is from January 1st to October 31st, 2023. And the main attributes was the, uh, is the ridership uh, so it counts as an entrance, and then also the time, for example, month, month, week, hour, and the un with the station unit, I would do like the ridership analysis. So before we jump into the station analysis, I would like to show the overall MTA ridership patterns. So you can see really obvious that there's the two different patterns of this. So when we do the uh, weekend and weekday aggregation like this, 
you can see that we they have the two pick right here our picks. The first one is 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. The second one is 3, 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. It's more like the go to work and get off work uh, hour. And then compared to the weekday, the weekend is more like smooth. There's only a, a small climb during the 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, there's another like interesting like uh, insights I'd like to show. It's like during the weekend night, uh, the ridership is r relatively higher than the weekend weekday night. So, so with these two groups, I would like to put all the stations in this to like different weekday and weekend groups. So that is based on the ratio of weekend top, uh, total ridership divided by the weekday total riderships. So with the charts and the mappings here, so you can see the distribu distributions. So, and I would like to go deep down to the hour perspective. So I'll pick up the weekday peak hour stations and also weekend nightlife stations. So the weekday peak hour stations, I'll pick up the a specific time slots from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. here. And then, so the definition of the weekday peak hour station is based on the ratio of the peak hours right total riderships divided by the weekday total riderships. So you can see that the light green is a res residential stations. I name it, it's like more like less ac ridership activity during the peak hours. And the darker green is the peak hour station, which means uh, the opposite it has more like ridership activity during the peak hours. So you can see that it's pretty obvious that the all, that like most of the weekday peak hour stations are located in the Manhattan. So you know, Manhattan is a aggregation of business areas and companies all there. So you can you can view that as a start journey of the get off, get off work journey. And then as for another perspective, uh, another feature is like the weekend nightlife stations. And this time I pick up the line life during the Friday night, Friday and Saturday midnight, and Saturday and Sunday midnight. So this one is based on the ratio of late night total ridership divided by the weekend total riderships. And you can see that there are some like dots are really far away from average. And they are all like aggregated on the south of Manhattan and also the, the Brooklyn, some Brooklyn station stop was really like necessary for the commuters to get into the Manhattan, like Jefferson Avenue or like Metropolitan Avenue. Yep, and then so, so for my con simple conclusion is like, how could the researcher affect the commuters or even the MTA team? So how could this kind of like c categorizations or more like the uh, trying to make the cluster help the MTA teams or commuters to know which station has a better time slot to do the construction or delays. And also, besides the time, this time I only do the time factors. Is there any other like features that I can do to learn what kind of like the characteristic of each stations? And for the research next steps, I'll use the MTA data for public interest needs and advocate for more like open data. So I'll like compare ridership between East West Transit corridors and Manhattan's, like partner with the MPPO and partner with a Renvin Arbany to advocate for more open data transparency and governance. And for a personal further inf investigation of ridership patterns, I'll incorporate with like trend delay data to an an analyze the clean average ridership data and also compare the different trend lines. So yeah, so for the next project, Hadi will introduce the HCMC Interact Mapping Digitization. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Haley. Um, so my presentation will focus on the design aspect of the work at our lab. And the project that I'm going to introduce to you is the Housing Court Must Change Map of Statewide Support. Um, this project started with a radar request from our client. They are the Right to Counsel NYC Coalition. They are an organization that is made up of tenants, organizer, advocates, and legal services organizations. And their main activities is leading campaigns to stop eviction crisis in New York. Um, one of their notable achievements is to win the right to counsel in 2017 and make New York the first city in the nation to establish a right to counsel for tenants 
facing evictions, which inspired a movement across the country. Their radar request is um, simple. They want us to build a mapping tool for their campaign called Housing Cross Must Change, which I would refer to after this as ACMC. And I would also recall, um, refer to our client as RTC. So um, what does design at the Beta NYC lab look like? I could summarize it into four main steps. First of all, um, for design, we want to identify the target audience of the final tools. Who is going to be the user of these mapping tools? What are their problems? Why do they come to us? Why does their current tools is not working for them? And what do they need for the new tools that we're going to build for them? We also want to identify the information needed to display on the map. After knowing all that, we go into sketching and wireframing to generate initial design idea for the map feature, the organization of information display on the map, and how the user is going to navigate through all that. After that, we bring the wireframe to our client for feedback and go back to iterate more on design before um, finalizing it for development phase. Usually, there's going to be more design iteration during the development phase, but the main design work happens before that. So first of all, in this case, what are the user problems? You could see on the screen, there's two screenshots of the current tools that RTC officers was working or was using. First one is a Google map that displays their current um, membership network. And the second one is the air table that they use to track the legislative, legislative support for the three bills in this campaign. The problem was that it was very difficult for them to navigate through these tools. And also using this, it's impossible for them to visualize the support for each of these bills in this campaign in relation to geographical locations. So in design, we have this exercise called How My We, which would help us brainstorm the solution for the user problems. In this case, it would be how might we create a one-stop shop for all the information that would be needed for them during this campaign? And how might we make it easier for the end user to visualize the legislative support for three bills in relation to the, to the geographical locations? After identifying the user problem, we were thinking about the information that would be needed on this map. Of course, it's going to be the legislative support for the three bills that they're currently working on in this campaign that they keep in an Airtable tracker. In order to put that on a map, we need geographic map layers like New York State Senate Districts and New York State Assembly Districts. Other key information are RTC membership. And so to push it further, to make this more helpful for the user of this mapping tools, we want to add more contextual information like geographic boundaries, counties, and zip codes, and also contact information of district representative and member organization to make this truly a one-stop shop of information for them. These are the initial sketches that I started um, at the beginning of the project. We start with the very rough sketch like this, but it helped us generate initial design idea of the map feature and where on the map that we're going to put different kind of information. And with this limited, limited space on a desktop screen and on a mobile screen, how are we going to display all of that information? Um, our color choice was based on um, the contextual information and also because this is a collaborative design of um, Right to Council Coalition and Beta NYC. We also use the variation from the logos of our organization's uh, branding logos. Um, we also conducted research to understand the New York State legislative context on how a bill is passed, and we think it's going to be very helpful to visualize that for our user so you could see on the screen this is an example of um, the bill's name is statewide right to councils and looking at the chart here the user will be able to see the current legislative support the senate support and the assembly support that they're currently having for this bill and it's going to be displayed on the left side panel of this map 
And like every other map, we're going to have legend and we have going to have map layer controls. Um, we use solid color to indicate that this um, um, the, the current view is having the support in this district. And the stripe is to indicate that um, the bill is getting no support in this one yet. And the map layer controls would help users to turn on different uh, geographic boundaries. In this case, it is um, Senate district and assembly district, and also the membership network that they are having. Putting everything together, this is what the final look, um, the map looks like. On the left side, it is the chart that I just introduced to you to let users know the current legislative support of a, a specific, specific bill. And on the right side, that's the map with the legend and the control panel that help users easily navigate and see the information that they needed that they got to the bill on the left side. Um, the tooltip is the features that let users know the legislative support on the map. And it's also going to be something that's complementary to the chart on the left. So in, by looking at the tooltips, user would be able to know which bill is currently being supported in each of the Senate or Assembly District. For the contextual information, we put it on the right side panels of um, the map. So click onto this two tips, user would be able to know the overlapping counties and zip codes of this um, specific district and be able to know the current um, contact information of the representative um, uh, district representative. Um, this project was a great success for us and our client was really happy. Um, we got a very positive feedback from them saying that this comes from a, an idea that they want to visualize something and it's like being implemented beautifully and it, it is something that's very easily accessible for their members. Um, you could access this uh, map via this link on the slide. Um, Next, uh, my coworker will present a very exciting project called FlatGen. So FlatGen, uh, we, we have just launched this tool today, actually. So check out our website. This, I just want to say that this is like a project that took uh, our entire team's effort. Uh, likewise, with the housing courts must change right to council map. Um, everyone in the lab participated and like collaborated on working on each of these two projects. Um, so what is FloodGen? FloodGen uses generative AI to create photorealistic images of predicted flooding. Um, flood projection imagery can be used to, number one, create awareness for communities who have not yet experienced flooding. Number two, create evidence for communities seeking resilience funding and projects. Um, some of which who have experienced flooding but have not yet uh, received the, the services or, or funding uh, for the resilience projects that they need in their communities. And number three, it could be used by decision makers to respond to and support advocacy efforts. So yes, we have these three community engagement strategies, um, awareness for new communities, evidence for resilience services and response to advocacy. Um, and it, this is really important to us because um, we presented this project like two weeks ago and there was another uh, private entity who had uh, a similar tool to use like generative AI to create flood based images as well. But they were like a private entity. So that means their data is private and they were just look at, looking on new locations to drive their LIDAR van <laughs> um, and not like sort of on the ground and, and making the partnerships that we know are, is, is really necessary to um, bridge and give back to the community. Um, so when you arrive at the site, um, you start with a map and you can explore different locations and once you click on one of the points, um, you can explore the projected flood imagery um, at that location. Um, there is some contextual data layers um, in the map. Um, so we used a sort of risk framework um, that looks at the uh, hazard itself, uh, the exposure, 
and uh, the vulnerability of, of certain communities to select a couple case study sites. So you can see these risk layers in the coastal flooding, uh, the stormwater flooding, uh, the disadvantaged communities, um, and the hurricane evacuation zones. So some of the features that we've included in the design of this site um, is the ability to kind of like hover over in tooltips and like investigate sort of the location in the map alongside the image um, of that street view location. Um, at the top, there are buttons that where you can toggle the different um, sort of flooding levels. So you can see the normal street view image, which was the input before the generative AI imagery. And then you can see different thresholds of flooding heights based on minor, moderate, and major flooding levels. It's, it's really important um, in light of using generative AI um, and putting this on a public facing website that we wanted to include a sort of disclaimer or um, a, a sort of educational warning on how to identify an AI generated flood image on this website. So um, a couple of the things to point out here is like we included a little flood gen logo at the bottom right corner anytime there is an image that was AI generated. Um, sometimes you'll see in some of the images, there's like blue skies because that's um, based on whatever this, the weather conditions were at the time when some of that uh, LIDAR data was recorded. Um, you'll notice that when the water meets some of the, the cars or objects in the foreground, there's like this blurred distortion. Um, and it, that's because like when it regenerates those pixels, it, it doesn't quite know like where to cut off that object. Um, so you might see like a car in the foreground that looks like it's like super submerged compared to uh, another object that might just only be submerged up to the wheel, which we know in reality probably wouldn't happen that way. Um, and you'll notice that the water is very clear. Um, so sometimes there's debris in real flood conditions if you see like real images of flooding. Um, but the way that the image generator works is it like, uh, I think like it has been like cleaned up a bit to create like renderings of sort of clear, calm water. Um, so I, I actually find this like surreal quality to the image very interesting um, because like it, it looks photorealistic, but then something feels not quite right about it. And I think that's like a very positive thing, uh, aspect about like the level of resolution that the image is. It doesn't need to be, uh, hyper real for us to be able to like use this technology to convey, um, what a potential flood scenario could look like. Um, but yeah. Uh, here's a quick recap of the five projects that our team presented today. Um, and like Eric had mentioned, you could find all of these resources. So if you are curious about what's under the hood in terms of like the web scraper or um, Audrey's um, uh, Tableau dashboard for the school budgets, or if you want to check out like the website links, but you don't quite remember what it, what it was called, this is the link for you. <laughs> um, it also has links to the data, the raw data that we used if you're curious to sort of uh, manipulate it further or um, try it yourself. Um, please reach out to any of us. We're happy to you know help with any data questions um, and a, a sort of recap of the Okay. Yeah, a recap of our process and submit a radar. We want to work from you and we want to partner with you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm Dimitri. I'm a Civic Innovation Associate. I'm working with the fellowship team at Beta NYC that she introduced earlier. I don't work directly with the lab, but I oftentimes get to see their work um, very, very early in the process. And it's always amazing and impressive how they always pull together these projects and really keep the technical aspect of Beta NYC alive and well. 
Um, so today, after hearing from their projects, we'll be having a small round of Q&A, and I'll be taking questions from each of you who have them, and I'll be posing them to the lab. So I'll just be a little bit of a referee in this process, and I'll first take your questions, and I have a few questions myself that I might ask um, the funding. So anybody here have a question for our lab team? Gen project. These all seem super awesome, and I'm definitely going to look into each of them more. I wonder how, um, like, the process will continue to grow, like, as data changes about like flood expectations and like, you know, rainfall predictions and whatnot, um, and whether your process sort of allows for the additional or like the addition of updated um, data. Yeah. yeah, we've we've talked to a number of like partners who are interested in like this ability to use generative imagery in this way. And one of the potential avenues that we're interested in like continuing the project is like tapping into like real time uh, data. Like so um, there may be a weather update that there's going to be a storm surge with X number of inches of rainfall and Ideally, like, so we've only selected like sort of 10 case studies in the New York City area to visualize those images, um, as you saw in those blue points. Um, that's just really a proof of concept, like a, a beta version of the project, if you will. Um, but ideally, we would be able to like sort of select any lat long point and then uh, through like spatial analysis. Um, we could cross reference the, the flooding data um, to see what the projected like, um, you know, flood levels or, or nuisance flooding might be. And then we could use that input into the image generation mask and set a certain height for that flooding. So I think that would be like the dream uh, as one way to use it as like an early warning system tool. Um, but yeah, we're really open right now at, to like making those partnerships. Uh, we have a couple conversations uh, with different partners. FloodNet just had a, a session uh, in slot number three. Um, so we've, we're, we're talking to them. We're trying to figure out how to best move forward in terms of like bridging community partnerships for how people actually want to use uh, the, the imagery for advocacy. And then we can go back to the drawing board and push further developments along. Um, I'm particularly very interested in the subway ridership patterns project. I noticed that in the, in the map, there was less data in um, Southern Brooklyn and Hughes area, and I wanted to know why. Like, was it because there wasn't just enough data in those areas? Um, actually, I get I just like fetch all of the data. I think it's because the ridership sizes. So it looks like compared to the Manhattan one, the Queens and Brooklyn looks like a, a relatively small. So yeah, so the data is all there, but I just like this ridership sizes different. Yeah. I have a follow-up question for about the same project. I noticed that the data set that you used was based on um, entrances to the uh, train station. I'm assuming that's based on like, the turnstiles themselves. You know, with increasing um, ferry evasion, how did you like try to mediate that issue? Because you know, my there's like a big discrepancy between how much people actually use the um, the train versus like you know how much people like the turnstiles. Yeah, I mean, this becomes a really challenging part of my project too. So because without the exit uh, perspective, I cannot really get the whole journey of the commutings. So what I can do is knowing that the point, uh, how they start, and then the time they start, why, why, they, why is this like, the stations becomes a important, crucial a spot for them to get inside. But maybe in the future, if I can get more data about it, I can do the more like contextualized journey of the data analysis and writer analysis. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the presentation. Um, I, my questions are more general. Or I'm just curious, you know, how many requests do you all get? 
sort of what the timeline is for, you know, to identify the need um, to actually secure the own process uh, to try to solve that. I would say it depends on the scope of your request. If it's something like, I don't know, uh, cleaning a data set, that might take a little bit, but it's not as involved as like building a whole custom tool. Um, I don't know, Eric, do you wanna jump in and talk about some of the other different ranges of radar requests that we have? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it depends a lot on uh, what we have working on at the moment, but we're usually pretty good at like, we not usually, we are pretty good about communicating <laughs> uh, with people who are interested in doing, uh, interested in radars. Um, sometimes people just need help like geocoding a very large amount of uh, points. Uh, they just have a lot of addresses. That's something we can get done like, pretty quickly. From, Turn back around uh, in case someone might not be as comfortable using the uh, geocoder API. Uh, we, just, we have things to do that automatically. Um, but other more involved things, uh, it might take a little bit more time on our end. Yeah. That is to say, we are a nonprofit organization. We're a small team of five, and we have limited bandwidth. Um, we. We also accept radars. Uh, like sometimes we don't always like charge a fee for this service. So sometimes things will be in a pipeline of work, and we're just gonna be able to get to it when we can. Um, if we're partnering with an organization and the project is aligned with our mission, and let's say they have um, funding from a grant, or if they're a government agency that does have uh, funding availability to partner with us, then that is like another way that we can work together. Um, hmm, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it like really depends. I would say like definitely like if you're curious about anything, submit a request. We'll have a conversation at the very least. We have like a five day turnaround time to at least get in touch with you via email. Um, and then we can tease out like the scope and the scale of the request um, directly with you. We really are interested in like helping as many people as we can, um, as long as it's in line with Beta NYC's mission. Yeah. Great. I remember that was a question here. Kind of already answered it, but I was going to ask about how you prioritize and select the projects. So it's Thank you. Yeah, great. It's, it's a challenging thing <laughs> to navigate. Um, some of the other work that we do in the lab, in addition to radars, is we work with, closely with community board, uh, sorry, borough president's offices to assist with the community board application process. We help um, community boards like set up like Airtable databases as well. So we do a lot of other like sort of technology, public interest technology support um, adjacent to local government as well. Um, so in the case of like right to counsel, um, they are uh, a coalition part of like, what is it, the, the right to counsel coalition. And we are also like members in that coalition. Um, so like we're sort of friends as organizations and it was in our mutual interest to work on that project um so yeah depends yeah okay we have about three more minutes i'll take maybe two questions okay okay i was going to say two questions but i have one question. so um i have a question about budget first of all i want to say it's all very cool one um <laughs> I have a question. I, I noticed that um, with Budget, and there was like a disadvantaged communities map view. Um, so I was wondering how certain communities were designated as disadvantaged because I've heard some words from people about maybe data not being able to capture what all all communities that are disadvantaged, um, unfortunately, and how you grapple with making sure that data sources are as updated as possible and accurately represented. Yeah, in our slide notes, <laughs> I, 
Actually, there was a data layer formerly called the environmental justice areas. And the mayor's office of climate and environmental justice, who is like sort of the publisher of that data set, they told us that, hey, don't don't reference this data set. It's old. It's from 2021. And it it categorized like something like 70 percent of New York City as like disadvantaged disadvantage or potentially disadvantage. So they pointed us to this other data set um, maintained by the New York State. Uh, e I don't want to like quote the wrong thing. I, the data is referenced on our website, but uh, it's, a, it's a state level data set um, that considers like, um, like historically disadvantaged or or disinvested communities, um, in addition to other like, like vulnerability uh, metrics like urban heat or flooding, um, and they pointed us to this data set as a more accurate or like updated representation of that. So, like any index, it it is imperfect, um, but uh, we were recommended <laughs> by the mayor's office that this is a better version of the environmental justice uh, data layer. So if anyone's like formally working with that layer, there is an updated resource. And that is like as of this week <laughs> that we found out about this one. Yeah. For each of your projects, uh, what's one thing that surprised so the project that I introduced today was the ACMC mapping tools, right? The thing that surprised me was that there was so many information that I need to put on the map at the same time in a very limited space. So uh, that was something that I actually like spent the most slide. time thinking about the design solution for that. Like, how do I give the user the permission to like, how do I know which one of the information among the list that's going to be the most important for them to put it at like the default state of the map, and then which one to give them the power to like turn on or off? So I think yeah, that was a, a great design uh, challenge for me, and that surprised me that in the end we could like view out the map like that and still keep all the information that our end user wants in that mapping tool. So yeah. It was a group work and group discussion that yeah, I really enjoyed. It was challenging, but at the end it was... <laughs> for me, it's about more like the analysis perspective, because when I get this kind of data, I'm not sure what the skill I'm trying to do it. Should I do it in a lines, lines comparison, or should I do it in stations? And what, time, what kind of time do I need to do the seasonal ones, compared to summer to winter, or something like that? There's the, the challenging part is there are too many perspectives, too many factions to do that. So I really learned a lot from from Z, but actually how to like scale down all this kind of like, uh, how to do the research project, yeah. What I found was I believe in 2023, at the time that I scraped the information, uh, around like a quarter of all uh, accepted uh, asylum or su successful asylum requests in the country were in courts within New York City, uh, which is a very large uh, represent over-representation of the city compared to every other place, uh, not just like city, but like some, it works even like some states in terms of how many accepted cases there are. So I think that that sort of makes a very strong case for uh, what was being spoken about before related to um, more funding on both the state and federal level to help address these, this issue. Well, I grew up in public schools, but outside of New York City. And so I feel like the more I learn about the New York City public school system, like the more in awe I am of how complex it is and how many working parts, like meeting with some of the stakeholders from community education councils, also some of them are part of a community education consortium, which is like a like non-government like um, advocacy group. And it's just so cool to see like all of the people that are so invested in this system and all of the kind of layers of leadership and oversight and even like 
the existence of the galaxy portal I think is really cool that people have access to that information because that wasn't the case where I grew up we didn't have access to like budget allocations data in the way that schools do here which is really great um in terms of like other insights I'm getting started on doing more macro level analysis about budget and allocation trends so I'm excited to see what kind of surprising trends pop out of that as I go into those next steps um, thank you so much for your amazing questions. Do keep in mind that you can reach out through the lab through the resources that they shared earlier in the presentation if you want to talk to them directly, or just send them a radar and get some of their technical help. So yeah, thanks again, everyone.